Today, 15 things every reefer should know about the science of water flow and reef tanks. What we wish somebody had told us day one, actually another one here, where I wish somebody had told me even 10 years in, there's so much to learn. Direct answer, the correct approach to water flow increases calcification rates, delivers energy, releases biological waste, the primary mechanism for gas exchange, prevents corals from poisoning itself, and tied at the hip, both create growth and coloration. And today, you'll find out why. Starting out with number one, everything you're about to learn about flow is related to a thing called the boundary layer. When you see flow hitting the coral, you may think it's hitting the coral, but it actually isn't. Yeah, if you look real close, uh, there's like a one to two milliliter layer uh, that is surrounding the surface that the water is going at. So it's not actually hitting it. It's like friction, yeah. right? Actually, that's preventing it. And so we need to penetrate that boundary layer, hit it with enough velocity that we can get all the nutrients mm -hmm. and cause all the gas exchange that the corals need. You're going to learn about that today. But note, there's this thing called the boundary layer. It's around every single coral and it's the thing that's preventing success. Number two, the reason tank turnover is actually kind of a garbage number is because what we're actually looking for is velocity, not just for the tank, but specifically at each individual coral and not just from one side of the coral. This is where science meets uh, quality advice for me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first toured uh, WWC, Josh told me that he doesn't want to give you a tank turnover number because it's garbage. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> 50X, 100X, 300X, it doesn't mean anything. And better understanding the science comes together, I understand, because once you really understand the boundary layer and all the effects it's going to have, and you will today, is, well, it's not just about 50X and you know three feet a second no. of velocity of the coral that's right in front of the thing. Well, the coral is like around the corner, <laughs> in the nook, underneath it. <laughs> that one's probably getting like a quarter foot a second. I mean, you could have a, a, a thousand times an hour, but if it's not hitting any of the corals, like what's the point? Okay, what you'll also find out is it's not just that, it's the side of the coral. So if you're yeah. pounding this side of the coral, <laughs> you're actually gonna see that coral grow, grow faster yeah. and better uh, on that side. You also see it in the innards of the coral. So it's not about a magic turnover. It's about getting the velocity everywhere in the tank. Number three, beating the boundary layer actually results in the elimination of toxic oxidants and it helps the coral avoid bleaching. Yeah, it does that because the zooxanthellae that was in the coral is using carbon dioxide and creating uh, uh, oxygen through photosynthesis. Okay, in the oxygen, it's building up all these oxidants and some of the free radicals within the, the uh, coral, which eventually will actually become toxic and poison the, uh, the coral, kill it. That's called bleaching at that point. To prevent dying, it will bleach and let go of all of its zoos yeah. and thelly. So the boundary layer here is how the coral gets rid of the oxidants. We need to get fresh water yeah. hitting the tissue, not going around the tissue. Uh, that creates gas exchange and allows the coral to free itself. And that's why you're going to see in so many cases, high light tied to high flow. Number four, again, beating the boundary layer is extremely beneficial because it results in the elimination of all of that leftover acidity from calcification and it avoids stunted growth. Yeah, you wouldn't think of uh, calcification causing acidity, but when the bicarbonate mixes with uh, the calcium to make calcium carbonate, the little H plus uh, pops, pops off. off. Yeah. Yes, so that hydrogen ion pops off and creates acidity inside the coral it cannot precipitate a skeleton mm. if there's acid inside the coral. So it needs to get rid of all those H pluses yeah. and it needs to do that by hitting, uh, the breaking the boundary layer, surrounding the, wa the coral with uh, water that has a lower level of the H pluses mm. so it can diffuse it out into the water. So uh, gro getting growth means beating the boundary layer and letting corals get rid of that excess acidity. Number five, beating the boundary layer doesn't just result in removing toxin, but it also delivers elements. And it's not the elements in the water column that we're talking about, but it's the elements that can actually make it into that boundary layer. Yeah, think about it this way. Uh, think about it, I might have 10 DKH in the tank as I tested it, yeah. but what is the DKH of that thin little boundary layer <laughs> that's around the coral? Because we wanted to diffuse it and make it easier to absorb calcium and alkalinity, probably specifically alkalinity mm -hmm. being the determining factor for growth in many cases. So uh, you really want to think about all of these things as you build that boundary layer and how do I beat it to be able to deliver elements and all the nutrients. 
Number six, in a very similar vein, beating that boundary layer results in the delivery of organic nutrients. But it's not the amino acids again in the water column, but what's in that boundary layer? Yeah, so uh, think about when you add your like uh, Red Sea AB. Yep, you I know, add it every day. Fills up the whole tank with this neon green. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's amino acids in here <laughs> right. and it's surrounding the coral. But if you were to take a really close look, you might find that it's actually not really hitting the boundary mm. layer all that well or absorbing. And the corals actually have an active transport mechanism where like electric elect, uh, uses uh, uh, conductivity to be able to attract kind of grab it, right? Grab it, yeah. attract the, the amino acids out of the water. And once it gets it, closes it and then opens up uh, one export, to let it back yep. in. So it can actually pull these things out, but it has to be in the boundary yeah. layer around it. And of course there'll be some, but we want it to be the same level as in the entire tank. Breaking the boundary layer delivers those amino acids and other organic nutrients to the coral. Number seven, seeing is believing. <laughs> yeah, you can actually see this in your tank. If you're watching your coral growth, you're gonna notice that the corals that get adequate flow, maybe even the most flow in the tank, they're gonna grow the fastest. Yes, you will see it all over. Go look right now. Go look in all <laughs> the little pockets where there's not a whole lot of flow. Those are your corals that are growing the slowest. Mm -hmm. Now that's not universally true. Some corals just grow slower. <laughs> right. uh, but uh, in most cases, you'll see that. You'll also, if you really evaluate it and see like, you know what? The corals that are getting the best flow are at that side of the coral is actually growing the best. The top of it, if I had gyres going across, growing better than the bottom of it. And you can start to see it because you would think like, just from you know the force of the flow that it might grow away from it but in many cases it's growing towards it because it's getting better biology in that direction. So seeing's believing. You can actually see this effect in your tank beating the boundary layer. I right, number eight, I do this sometimes, stole the thunder. Hey, it's still really important to mention one more time, but you're gonna see if you're looking at a coral, the side of the coral that gets the most flow, I mean, not too much flow, but the right amount of flow, it's going to grow faster. Yes, and in fact, if you think about this as uh, different species too, it's the right amount of flow. Yeah. So with SPS, man, you want to pound them in most cases. These, these corals live fairly up and they have turbulent mm -hmm. waters, you know, and we know even in the ocean that high flow is tied to high light. Yeah. Okay, but what about something like euphilia, right? Okay, well that is a much more uh, like a fragile yeah. polyp, right? And they're big and they're puffy and they're easily mm -hmm. damaged. All right, still need to break, break the boundary layer but the boundary layer there is just gonna be slower and probably a little bit easier to use, uh, beat because the actual yes. coral is moving around as well. Number nine, seeing as a believing again. Okay, go ahead and look at your tank right now. Look at a larger colony. You will probably notice that on the outside of the coral, it's super healthy, but oftentimes at the inside, it's dying or dead because there's just not as much flow. You know, some people would think this is related to light and uh, it might be somewhat related to the right, but also it's related to the fact that the outside of the coral is getting the best biology. It's yeah. getting that three feet a second uh, or uh, of uh, velocity or whatever is good for that coral. Mm -hmm. But the insides may be like nearly a dead spot in terms of almost no flow, which creates a dead spot of actual tissue as well. Uh, they tend to look smaller and more compact and they just don't grow as well. So if you get a lot of flow everywhere and make it turbulent and get yep. in there, you'll actually see it grow much better. Number 10, there is a good reason why flow, lighting, and SPS corals are really intertwined. It's because rapid photosynthesis makes all of these biological processes happen so much mm. faster, which means elimination and replenishment of gases and nutrients become so much more important. And that is why you'll see over and over and over again, the most successful tanks and the best counsel from the most advanced reefers will always tell you that you have to pair super high flow with high uh, lighting. If you wanna ride the razor's edge of lighting, you gotta ride the razor's yeah. edge of flow. And we're not talking about 300X or 100X. We're talking about looking around the tank and saying, there's a dead spot, there's a dead spot, <laughs> there's a dead spot, and fixing it. Number 11, drill this in. This is why that 50 times, 100 times turnover rate is a worthless number. It matters what the flow is at each of the corals, not for the entire tank. If you have 50 times, but it's not hitting those corals, it just doesn't matter. So what is the flow at each of those corals? All right, I'm gonna stop short of doesn't matter at all because it does matter for the corals that are in front. Well, of course. But do we are those <laughs> the only ones that we care about? Or what about all the rest of the other ones? So it doesn't matter for them. So really think about it. I'm looking for a turnover, but I'm looking at a turnover at each individual coral and not even at the coral, 
but on the top, on the bottom, and the left, and the right. Number 12, flow is also a pollution export, not just from the corals, but from the entire tank. If you don't have adequate flow, you're just gonna get piles of detritus. It really becomes the landfill pockets of your tank and flow will eliminate that. I think that's the best way to say it, is uh, it just becomes like where all this stuff collects and it just soaks in and becomes mm -hmm. the landfill until it decays. When I started this 20 years ago, every single tank that I saw was just rocks like stacked up on the back. And that is where all the garbage collected, yeah. you know, behind the tank and you could see it and stir oh, it up. So gross. Okay, now every single person I know, uh, everybody in my circle that reefs uh, would never set it up that way again. They take the rock off the back. Now they provide flow in the back to keep all that stuff suspended, A, so that the fish and everybody can mm -hmm. eat it, but also so what doesn't get eaten goes down the overflow. Mm -hmm. So the way that I've seen it done, some of the best ways for me is if you have a bare bottom, actually put, put in some like MP40s yeah. down there because I say MP40s just because you don't want to have a cord going all the way yeah. down to the bottom. But also a good option is the gyres. Yes. It shoots like a sheet across the back. And because the pump's kind of, you know, a big cylinder yep. and the cord just kind of follows, you can hide it behind there, actually looks pretty slick in there as well. You know, one of the things I did, I just set up a hundred gallon frag system and I just didn't want all that detritus to build up underneath those frag racks. Mm -hmm. So I actually just went out, bought some cheap PVC, drilled some holes, put a pump in there, and I have a, a spray bar that keeps it completely clean all the time. Yeah, old tank syndrome or wherever the hell that was uh, from 20 <laughs> years ago, uh, all the garbage building up yep. your tank and one day the tank just doesn't like it. Well, one of the causes of that, you can just eliminate it. Get rid of the landfills in your tank mm -hmm. by providing flow and keeping all that stuff suspended. Number 13, flow is not just about removing pollution, but it's also about adding oxygen into the tank. It really is the primary driver of gas exchange. It's, it's how those fish get their oxygen and how you spread that out through the tank. Basically, you aim, you know, one of the power heads and it creates turbulence mm -hmm. in the top and all that water molecules are just exposed to oxygen uh, and it brings oxygen into the tank. Uh, the big takeaway here, because it'd be hard to mess this up catastrophically, like uh, with not, a less, not enough flow if you followed anything else for the corals, mm -hmm. uh, it's that what happens when the power goes down, right? Mm -hmm. This is the number one thing that will happen is the uh, fish will suffocate to yeah. death. Though, because once the water's stagnant, it no longer has that gas exchange in the same manner. Well, that's exactly why we have things like the battery backup here. Or if you want to go super old school, you could buy a, a whole bunch of, you know, battery <laughs> powered air stones. Something. It's a plan. It's it just... Think about right now, when's the last time you saw the power go mm -hmm. out? If it was 10 years ago, probably not a big deal. If it was three times last month, probably is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and think about it this way. There is battery backups for DC options. It would be, I'd have one pump on this because these yeah. things last like, you know, Oh, I thought it was like 72 hours yeah, or quite something a bit. like that, a few days. Uh, outside of that, you can also get a battery backup from a computer, which usually lasts for like four and eight hours, depending on how big a one you got. You can also get something that's like 30 bucks, which is just an inverter that you strap yep. onto your car battery and run an extension cord in your house, <laughs> Easy. right? So there's tons and tons of really cheap options, but when the power goes out, the stores don't have those things anymore. No. So pick up one of those options. My suggestion is actually one that turns on automatically when you're either sleeping or at work, like a DC power option. There are also those air bubblers that are battery powered and you can they recognize when the power goes mm -hmm. out and a little stream of bubbles not really the greatest no, option good. and you have this tube going in there but it will work in a pinch way way better than leaving it alone number 14 flow is actually not a brand i see this all the time like uh, i use a couple of vortex so the only thing i'll use is vortex, vortex. everywhere because it does look nice that way it does uh but uh reality is it's an angle it's a velocity it's aimability right tool right job so like you can use the gyres to go across the top. You can use the gyres to go across the back. You can use uh, the uh, Vortex or the uh, Neros to shoot velocity and turbulence across the front. You can use the Tunes, probably the most underutilized pump out there because you can aim it in every direction. It's like a 360 yep. globe, right? Yep. Uh, you can use that to get it down into the pockets or areas that you would never ever be able to hit. And also specifically with the tunes, if you look at it, there are some that shoot out a little beam and there's also some that shoot out a big giant cone. Now it's the difference, it could be 2000 gallons an hour either way, it's a difference of like your hose of squirting yep. it down and it shoots 30 feet or it turns into a mist, you know? So for like an LPS tank, I want the 2000 gallons an hour. I want to be able to break that boundary rail, but I want to do it 
you know, more gently as it's surrounding the whole entire thing and it's moving around. Big cone, probably a better option here. Number 15, turbulence and varied flow is actually how are you gonna break that boundary layer without harming the coral? Yeah, 20 years ago, we just beat it. We oh. turned them on, man. They were on, they're just hitting it the same way all day, mm -hmm. every day. And it's not the way that happens in the ocean, nope. right? So the way that we break the boundary layer now without harming the coral and just pummeling its tissue is varied flow. You see those like reef crests and mm -hmm. different things where it's coming on and it's coming off. And like we're seeing the two a, uh, pieces together, yeah. of uh, our flow hitting each other, creating turbulence. That is how we're going to break the boundary layer without harming the tissue and having it too strong all the time. My number one takeaway from this whole conversation is flow shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be the thing you think about before you set up your tank. It should be about how you aquascape and where you place your corals. I mean, a lot of us just think, hey, let's just put this one here because it looks nice and it's gonna create this flow, but you need to think about it more in terms of the corals. What's gonna be best for them? Every single generation of my aquascapes get better than the yeah. last one. And I had this very conversation last week, actually, mm. whereas the next aquascape, I would actually build around the flow, select the flow first. first. Yeah. Yeah. And then build the, the yeah, aquascape to match that because it can actually get kind of hard uh, if you get too artsy with it, oh. uh, then to try to fix it with a million pumps. Like 20, yeah. So <laughs> think about the flow first. That's a great, great counsel. Uh, and you'll actually be more successful in the end. My number one takeaway is that WWC team and a lot of people that have been doing this for a long time will all tell you that getting flow right is actually more important yeah. than getting lighting right. And you'll spend a ton, a ton, a ton of time, you know, thinking about the right lighting and getting the right, right. settings and it's a cost of fortune as well. And then here's a couple pumps, we'll just throw them inside and call it a day. <laughs> After you know what you know today, you'll know that there's a way, way, way better to do it, way to do it. And you know that all of those thought leaders out there, those people that have been doing this for decades, and some of them even commercial level success, know why that they pay, take flow is more important than lighting. And you can take that wisdom and add it to your tank. Learn something unexpected about flow today. Well, there's more in our water flow, did you know playlist right here. And there's new episodes of BRS TV released every Monday and Friday.